So we are here to tell you about how to get more computing power from your uh, hardware just by helping the operating system scheduler on your nodes. My name is Antti Kervinen, I'm a cloud op orchestration software engineer working at Intel. And now I'm going to let Shasha continue from this. Uh, and I'm Alexander Kanievsky, but less formally is Sasha. Uh, I'm principal engineer of uh, Intel. We are working in the same team, focusing on res resource management, uh, a lot of activities across the Kubernetes. But today we are going to talk about like web performance and how it affects our application. And first of all, let me be a bit of a bad cop. So you heard already like Swati and Francesca today. So I'm going to put a bit more darker colors to, to, what, to what you already heard. I know you've seen this picture like that about like NUMA problem several times. You have data dispersed, you have container dispersed across your whole machine, uh, not working properly. So everything what we've seen so far today mentions let's do the NUMA scheduling, NUMA affinity. That's a usual scenario. Let's pin the containers. Let's alloc allocate the data close to the CPUs. We will get something better. True, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. Right now in Kubernetes, it works for guaranteed containers. For burstable, for best effort, it doesn't work. If you want to improve it, we need to do some better solution. Same thing goes to uh, containers which is communicating to each other. Right now, topology manager and the rest of herd of managers were focused on one single pod. Yes, we can handle several containers within pod, but what happened if you have multi-pod application, let's say front end plus your memcached and they are communicating with each other? You need to have affinity. You need to say somehow to Kubernetes what those two will be working together. This allows to hardware to do a bit more efficient scheduling and data transfers. You get a common L3 caches, you get optimizations on the memory channels, and so on. Kubernetes right now doesn't have it. We have it on the cluster level, on the scheduler side. We don't have it on the runtime side, when we are running with things. Another thing, again, how we, from as a users, we can help with hardware and the OS to give you a bit more performance. Right now, most of the time, when you run application, it creates a lot of threads, it consumes all the available CPU cores, and so on. What it means in reality in the hardware? It means that those cores are not sleeping. Those cores run like certain period of time when sleep. If we can somehow to instruct the kernel what those containers doesn't really actually need the whole set of cores. You don't need to uh, run everything on every single available CPU core. Group it, group it into the smaller pieces. It will allow your kernel and your hardware to bump the turbo frequencies. So your workload most probably will finish earlier, will benefit with the higher frequencies, and as a consequence, you will get a better like power savings because not all the cores are running. And all of this is just like a tip of iceberg if you are starting to think how these pieces of hardware can be exposed uh, to the end user. And as we saw from uh, Francesca and Swati, uh, our usual suspects, Kubernetes, how to implement all of this, scheduler, how to get all of this information, and then last but not least is user experience. How to end user to express what he actually needs for his workload. And there are a bunch of problems with that. So like in a restaurant, you don't tell the chef which knife to use to cut the meat. You just order your steak and you say, I want rare, medium or something. Same here, we need to have a way to express what is important for you and how to do it. The problem, how we implement that. So if we go to Kubernetes side, we cannot implement all possible hardware. 
So the pictures what you've seen, it's for hardware which was uh, actual like five, six, ten years ago. The current hardware is not like that. The upcoming hardware will be even more different in terms of what we consider it as hardware resource zones. Kubelet should work, should be simple, should be working everywhere. The same for the scheduler. Yes, we can try to expose that information to the scheduler, but we need to understand the cost. So the more algorithms we are exposing, the bigger delays we will have in the scheduler side. You have a heterogeneous nodes, you have more algorithms the scheduler needs to be aware of. You want to optimize not for the hardware, but wants to optimize for, for example, for the queue groups or pool groups of, of your workloads or batch jobs, as we've seen in Volcano presentation. You need to have another policies. So all of this in current Kubernetes, it's simplified. We, we are trying to find a way how to do it in extensive way and more user-friendly. Thanks. So, as Sasha emphasized that there are problems and we, what we need really is the flexibility to be able to manage the jobs we, uh, and uh, add to the whole framework this kind of uh, flexibility and there are, there are now a couple of options so, so that if we do that on the kubelet level there, there is this herd of managers, the topology manager, the CPU manager, memory manager. So th those would meet, need to be like pluggable so that resource management algorithms could uh, make their way into the Kubernetes itself. But there is also another option. So if we go one layer below, so if we go to the container runtime level, there we can do something, uh, something smarter. So we can forget that maybe we don't need to go through that door. Maybe we can jump out of that box in some other way. And this is what the CRI resource manager is actually about. So regarding the features of this CRI resource manager, we provide a zero configuration CPU and memory pinning, meaning that if you just at the CRI resource manager to your nodes in your cluster, you don't need to do actually anything else. And the CRI resource manager is starting to manage your jobs and uh, like placing them to the CPUs and memories so that uh, they really give you the performance benefits. And here on the slides, we have the links to some material this is, which is actually now reporting that what kind of performance benefits you, we have observed. And on the other hand, as you saw, these kind of affinities that were needed in the, to solve, solve these problems that if two containers are uh, tightly bound to each other and communicating with each other a lot, so it makes sen sense to run them very close to each other, even inside the node. So not only like, as we saw earlier, nodes communicating with each other, but now we are talking in the processor level. So put them to the same NUMA node so that they are using the same memory DIMMs that are very close to that uh, processors. So for that purpose, there is a way for users to add this kind of container affinity information. And in addition to that, uh, CRI resource manager also allows defining quite custom uh, resource management policies so there are pretty easy APIs for creating your own uh, resource alignment and management algorithms. For instance, just to mention a couple of those. So there's a pot pools algorithm that allows you to say that I want like sets of three pods to run on Y CPUs, say like four CPUs and they share the CPUs among each other. So this was something that one of our customers needed and that's what's, that is implementable in a, in a matter of hours or in a matter of days using CRI Resource Manager and you don't have to tell anything uh, to Kubernetes about that. So another example is the balloons resource management policy where we can pin containers 
to, to CPUs into the pools that are actually like growing, inflating and deflating depending on the needs, resource needs of that, uh, those pods. So this is dynamic and you can also dynamically adjust CPU frequencies of the CPUs inside that pod. So how this all works, where, where it really goes, the CRI resource manager. So this is the, how, how the things are now. Typically in Kubernetes nodes, so there is a kubelet and it is co communicating with a container runtime. Often container D can be also a cryo. And then uh, what this means today, that if you want to add CRI resource manager into your uh, node, then kubelet starts communicating to it instead of the container runtime. And here resource manager is doing the CPU pinning, memory pinning, and running these algorithms and then telling the underlying container runtime, which is still your favorite container runtime, that how to, how to really pin those CPUs and manage the resources. But this is the, the, where we are today and this is where we really would like to be, uh, say, this year still, so that Kubelet would be again communicating directly to the container runtime and container runtimes would have a uh, NRI, which is like node resource interface, and that through that you could use CRI resource manager. What's the benefit on this compared to this where we are today is that you can actually apply and you can deploy CRI resource manager to your Kubernetes node directly and you don't have to go to the node level and configure this kind of uh, kubelet container runtime stack. So. so just as I mentioned, if, if we start to look at the hardware problems and how to expose it, it will be just a tip of iceberg. And actually, the CRIRM uh, is just our project. It started as a demo vehicle, but right now it's in a shape what it can be used in the production. But what was the thing to showcase what how different policy, how, how is the different variants of uh, resources can be exposed in a user-friendly manner uh, to the applications. Beside that, uh, we have in CRIRM uh, implementation of last level cache control, memory bandwidth, block IO, and so on. What we are trying to do is all of those small pieces what we have is going to appropriate places in the upstream. So for block IO, for cache controls and memory bandwidth controls, those patches just recently got merged into Cryo and Containerd. Already today you can start using web functionality uh, using annotations. We have a cap which is uh, talking about the class-based resources. So cache, block IO is one example of uh, those class-based resources. Another example can be like different memory types. So you can have a workload which says, I want high bandwidth memory. I want combination of DRAM plus slower tier of memory, and so on. Which is currently not possible, but hopefully will be done at some future. We have uh, ways how to use accelerator more properly. So our team, uh, well, in addition to NVIDIA, practically like this, we're only two publicly available device plugins for, for the Kubernetes. So we know how, what is the problems uh, in, to expose the accelerators to the Kubernetes. Uh, together with NVIDIA, we implemented uh, the CDI interface. It's container device interface on, on, the, on the runtime level, how to expose the devices. And now in Kubernetes, we have this dynamic resource allocation cap. This is about how you can uh, fully control your accelerator devices. So you are not anymore requesting, I want just one GPU. You can say, I want GPU of particular class. I want GPU with particular uh, interconnect. I want GPU with particular uh, amount of memory, and so on and so forth. And this is like iterative changes to existing Kubernetes. Further down the line, we most probably we will need to think about more uh, bigger changes to, 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 to the way how Kubernetes is working. 
So, as we mentioned, the kublet is already complex, hard to maintain, uh, and not really universal. To make it more simpler, but to have uh, this good separation of concern between what and how, we will definitely need to evolve the CRI protocol. We will need to figure out how the information about product and containers communicated to, uh, to the runtimes. Uh, we need to understand how the resources are discovered and reported to the nodes. So we think what was presented as uh, like separate uh, topology exporter, it can be a part of a future CRI protocol. We things like the errors of admission of the pods and rescheduling them or avoiding the scheduling errors. It's again, it's something what we need to investigate how we will fit it in the future. And well, that's it what we had for today. Thank you. I think we are right on the time. Uh, questions, I don't think we have time, right? So we probably... We have a coffee break, so maybe one minute, and then okay. we can continue the conversation outside. <laughs> sure. Great. Thanks. Um, do, do you think that the pod spec, is it um, good enough to express these? Do we have any problems at that level? Like the, you know, do we need anything extra in the pod spec to express, I want these two GPUs in the same, or do you think that is not where the problem is? So in pod specs, we have several problems which is not solved and which, which is actually some of those caps are trying to, to solve. So if we are saying, I want two GPUs and I want these particular parameters, uh, with the current resource model where GPUs are represented as extended resources, it will not fit completely. So we learn it from storage to have claim of those GPUs. So you get the separate objects which describes, I, w I want to claim, I want to allocate me this amount of GPUs with that properties. And when the pod spec will be referencing this object saying, I will be using that. That's one side. So if we're talking about the classes, uh, we don't have anything right now. So what we are proposing is to have uh, on the pod level and on the container level uh, field resources, classes, and when you have key value pairs, uh, what you have. And uh, the current proof of concept implementation includes practically everything, like the whole chain from discovery, runtimes, scheduler, resource quotas, and so on. But the linked cap is simple part, is just like the first part, like what is in the pod spec, what is in the CRI protocol. Uh, regarding affinities, so right now in the pod spec, we have no affinity constraints, and you have uh, required during scheduling, ignored in runtime, preferred, and so on. We need the same, but for runtime side. So I don't know, will we start with exposing that on the scheduler side, but on the runtime side, we need to have this similar fields required on runtime, preferred on runtime. Um, a bit complication compared to uh, what we have with node affinity is what, like node affinity constraints, we usually work on the um, scope of pod. So you're saying, I, I want this pod uh, affinity to that pod or anti-affinity. Uh, here it's a bit more complicated. You want to say, I want my front end with memcached together. But you might have also more complex affinities. Let's say I have my database and I have my logger or backup container. I want to be running uh, with back low priority container in some other area, in some other CPU pool. So you need to have way to express also uh, within port container affinity and affinity. So the syntax will be most probably a bit more complex. Thank you so much. Yes. Thanks.